Okay, good evening, everybody. It is December 7th. This is a meeting of the ETAC, Envision Eugene Technical Advisory Committee. I'm Tiffany Edwards, the current chair. Welcome, good to see you all, it's been a while. Um, first thing is we are not gonna have public comment tonight because we are in a virtual setting. And so um, uh, the, the city's doing public comment in person these days. So we're just gonna, if folks out there listening have anything to uh, communicate to the committee, we can, you could do that through um, email. So uh, we'll just go ahead and Zoom meeting protocol, I think you all know the drill. I, I now can see the list of participants. So if you do have a comment or anything, just raise your hand, I'll be able to see it, whether I can see your face or not. Um, and moving on to the next thing, let's just move on to the agenda review now that we have a quorum. Although, hey, Rick, can you hear us? Can you, can you do this if you can? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Perfect. but we could we could tell you were having some technical difficulties. So good to see, good to hear you now. And sounds like you can hear us. I can um, hear everybody. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, I just want to make sure that everyone um, had a chance to review the the um, the Zoom meeting summary back from August. Um, so if anybody has any questions or adjustments or whatnot, um, I would take a motion. Lisa, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, awesome. I just uh, I was hoping Elena could maybe put the direct link to the folder because when I clicked on the link in the email, I couldn't find the folder, the ETAC folder. I found many, many folders, but couldn't find the ETAC folder. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. You want me to email that out to you or? Can you put it in the chat? In the chat. Or... Yeah, I can try and do that. Thank you. Or an email. Sorry to interrupt. I just, yeah. Okay. Well, um, all right. If anybody wants to make a motion, don't all this do it at Howard, once. Move, <laughs> uh, this is Howard. I'll move approval of the uh, August uh, meeting minutes. Okay. Do I have a second? All right. Rick seconds. Um, so any discussion? They were pretty, pretty basic, uh, in my opinion, I thought they were pretty good, great summary. Uh, all right, so I will uh, call for a vote. All of those in favor to approve the August 17th, 2023 meeting minutes, um, raise your hand. All right, and then any opposed and any abstentions? Okay, I see Lisa's abstention, thank you. All right, let's move on. I'm gonna kick it over to Heather, Leah, and Stuart, who are all gonna cover the second item on our agenda, which is the Urban Growth Strategies UGB Overview. Um, so I think I'll just hand it over. You guys go for it. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see. So just a little preamble um, before I share my screen and then want to do introductions. Um, so as you all know, we recently updated the ETAC, I guess it's been probably a year now almost, um, the ETAC bylaws to explicitly state the ETAC's role um, in reviewing and providing guidance to staff on the technical aspects when we conduct our periodic 20 year um, urban growth boundary analysis. Um, so we're kicking off that next UGB analysis uh, in January, which we are now calling urban growth strategies. So you'll hear more about that. Um, so tonight, our goal is to provide you with an overview of the components that fall under that umbrella, similar to the one that we gave to Planning Commission. Um, so some of you have heard this a little bit already, but we're going to highlight where um, ETAX roles are in those components. Um, and so before we get to that, like I said, I'd like to go ahead and do introductions. Um, some, but not all of the staff that will be working on the on this large project. Um, are going to present tonight, um, but a couple folks you have already worked with that um, will also be working on the project. Um, Elena will be working on the project, um, Thea, Zoli, um, Rebecca, 
Uh, so they're all working on it, but are not presenting it tonight. Same with Terry. Terry's here. Um, but we have some new staff, so it's a good opportunity for you to meet them as well. So I was hoping we could just do staff introductions and say what our role is on the project. And then I'd like ETAC to go around the room also, the virtual room, and um, introduce yourselves um, to our new staff too. So I'll start. I'm Heather O'Donnell. You know me. Um, probably too well, apologies. <laughs> um, and uh, right now I am coordinating the city staff side of the next UGB analysis update. And then we have consultants that are the project managers on their side. Um, and then obviously helping with the connection to growth monitoring. Um, and I will kick it to Stuart. Good evening, everyone. My name is Stuart Warren. I am your newest associate planner on the community planning and design team. I am the public involvement and policy lead for the comprehensive plan, or phase two of the comprehensive plan. Leah? Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Leah Rausch. I've actually been with the city for a little over a year now, so not so new anymore, but I will be Let's see, doing a lot of the housing work. So I'll talk to you more about that tonight, but our housing production strategy um, and efficiency measures, and then kind of managing the integration with the climate friendly and equitable communities work, specifically the climate friendly areas designation. And we'll talk more about how that fits into that. Um, and then I'm the public involvement lead for kind of the UGB components of this work. Harry, do you want to say what your role is? Absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Terry Harding. I'm the principal planner for community planning and design, and it's lovely to see you all. Uh, my role is to oversee coordination amongst the various projects on our team and kind of liaise to the planning commission and council along with our planning director. Uh, so I don't have a part in the presentation tonight, but I um, I'm happy to be here and support whatever this group needs. And I just want to say thank you real quick. You're um, tireless volunteers, and we really couldn't do this work without you. It means a lot. Thank you. Right. Thanks. You know, Elena and I, um, ETAC members. I'd love for you to introduce yourselves. <laughs> okay, I'll start. And if, if people want to just jump in. Um, so I think I know everybody, but uh, I'm Tiffany Edwards. I'm the chair, current chair of ETAC. I'm, I also am the chair of the planning commission, which is one of the hats I wear in this group. I am also, um, I'm, I'm in case, I don't know if everybody knows this, but I'm actually back with the Eugene Chamber of Commerce. I had been at LTD for a bit um, and I served in, in the in the capacity representing kind of both of those interests, but I'm back at the chamber, so um, that's me. Um, let's go to Councillor Yay, and we'll just, I'll just kind of call on people, make it easier. Thank you. So I'm Jennifer Yay, and I am the city councillor who was um, appointed to this group, assigned. I don't know. I was asked if I wanted to do it, and I said that sounds like fun, and so <laughs> and here I am. So um, yes. And, well, we're lucky to have you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Okay. How about Howard next? I'm just going to go in um, order where you are on my screen. Hi. Um, well, I've been on ETAC, uh, I guess, since the beginning. And uh, I was originally uh, on it as uh, uh, when I was chair of the Sustainability Commission, which uh, I termed out. My other activity uh, with the communities, I'm, I am a vice chair of the uh, board of the Lane Regional Air Protection Agency, which uh, flanges up with my uh, career that I used to have before I retired. Thanks, Howard. I'm going to go to Phil next. Yeah, thanks for rubbing it in, Howard. Appreciate it. <clears throat> well, I'm still working. Uh, I'm the uh, planning and real estate development director for CDC Management Corp. That's the real estate office for the Chambers family here locally. Uh, we just built uh, a large uh, five-story apartment house, 127 units, the city's first uh, residential mass timber um, building. 
about a block from the Knight Science Campus. And we're working, um, you know, have a pretty broad portfolio of other properties. And then I also serve as the board president for Cornerstone Community Housing. So I see how things work on the affordable housing side as well. So uh, been here with you guys here on the ETAC, um, one of these many months or years, whatever, however long it's been. And uh, been a long time planning nerd. So thanks a lot for having me. Thanks, Phil. Okay, next is Sue. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> so I'm Sue Pritchard. I had a long career as a commercial real estate broker here in Eugene. Um, my original involvement started with the neighborhood groups regarding infill compatibility standards, which was, I mean, maybe like 20 years ago. Um, that led to a co-chair position on the technical resource group, which then evolved into ETEC. Um, I have a strong interest in land use topics just as they relate to real estate because that was my career. But the most important thing is that since I've last seen you all, I have had cochlear implant surgery. So you know that all of you know that I have severe hearing loss and have had for many years and it progressed to the point where I just was having to work so hard to hear and my hearing aids were no longer um, doing the job. So uh, at the end of September, I had cochlear implant surgery and it is a freaking miracle. I, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can hear things that I never heard before. And, uh, and also I don't even require the hearing loop anymore or the little tiny mini microphones. I mean, I've spent the last 30 years literally working so hard to hear. And as it progressed, it was becoming increasingly more difficult. So I'm so excited that I think maybe the next in-person meeting we have, you guys won't have to use a microphone, which is really just, stunning at my age. I have to tell you, I'm so excited about that. So that's my big news. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. That is big news and congratulations. That's very cool. Um, I've got Rick and then Lisa, and then I think that's it. Hi, I'm Rick Duncan. Um, let's see. I started on this thing a couple of years ago when I joined the planning commission in 2002. And we started on all this in 2007 with ECLA, which was the land. I don't remember what that acronym means anymore. Um, so I've been involved in this process for a few years. My background is I was a re residential and commercial real estate appraiser and developer, and I own real estate and property manage. And I currently am on the River Road Santa Clara uh, GAC. I'm part of that group that's trying to get that plan through, which we're moving through slowly, but getting there. Uh, so I've been involved in this for a long time. I'm very much interested in housing. Uh, I know a little bit about that and have studied it since the 60s, uh, even though I didn't start in real estate until the 70s, but I've gone back a lot of years past. So some institutional knowledge. Thanks. Indeed. All right, uh, Lisa, I mean, it looks like you'll be the one to wrap it up and then we'll get back to presentation. Great. Wrapping it up, <laughs> Lisa Arkin. <clears throat> um, I've been on ETAC, I think from the beginning, <laughs> um, although sometimes the meetings conflict with my work, so I'm sorry if I missed the last one or two or three. Uh, I'm the executive director of Beyond Toxics, and so my focus is on environmental justice, I did serve seven years as a Lane County Planning Commissioner. <clears throat> I really love the topics uh, related to land use, and I also work on land use issues at the state level. Wonderful. Okay. I think that's all of the squares I see. So great. Thank you so much. Um, all right. Okay. So I am going to share my screen. momentarily.
Looks good, Heather. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, as per usual, I can only see a few of you. So, um, and we're gonna be alternating as we go through this presentation. So definitely staff, um, if I go too fast or you need me to go back, please jump in. Um, but we'll do questions at the end. Um, we have quite a bit of content to get through. this over. Okay, so in introducing this new suite of work, I want to first go ahead and go back to this graphic that you have seen before. Um, and so this is showing how we originally envisioned the relationship between growth monitoring, UGB analysis, and urban reserves. Um, so just as a reminder, the monitoring program, as you well know, is an ongoing cycle of collecting, reporting data, and then comparing the monitoring data to our previously adopted assumptions mm -hmm. about how we'd grow between 2012 through 2032. Um, and a new urban growth boundary analysis is triggered when those monitoring results are significantly different than our assumptions or every five years. Um, in that urban growth boundary analysis, if we don't have enough land for the projected 20 year need, the next 20 year need, then we look for additional um, land use efficiency measures, which we'll talk about later um, on how to use our land more efficiently. And if we still don't have enough land for the next 20 years, then we look at expanding our urban growth boundary. Um, so as we've talked um, previously at the ETAC, since our monitoring program began, Eugene and other cities with a population of at least 10,000 are now mandated to adopt a new urban growth boundary um, analysis for housing called a housing capacity analysis every eight years. And so that's, that's kind of that purple box, um, but it's only required for housing. So again, we'll talk more about that, but um, so this graphic, we're still using this graphic, but um, we have to use it in the context of the new state rules. Um, but luckily with the monitoring data, all of those same steps have to happen. And so we're gonna be using monitoring data that you've been looking at to inform all of those same steps to help us meet this new schedule. And so, um, this urban growth boundary analysis, or as we're transitioning the name to urban growth strategies, um, this will be our first full-blown review of our 20-year land needs with the intention of adopting a new land need for a new 20-year period and how we're going to meet those demands. So you'll remember we did the comprehensive report back in 2021, and we reran the buildable lands inventory. Um, we looked at as much data as we could, but we knew we weren't planning to adopt that buildable lands inventory or that report as our land study. That was like our first comprehensive report. This new suite of work that we're gonna be talking about is with the intention of adopting new land studies um, and a new buildable lands inventory and a new 20 year period. Okay, and so, like I said, that's what this new suite of work is intended to do, is to complete our next 20-year UGB analysis for housing, um, as well as, um, even though we don't have the mandate, we are also looking at 20-year need for jobs and other urban land needs. Um, but you'll also see that this work encompasses more than just looking at the boundary itself. It also relates to our strategies um, all of these components relate to our strategies for managing urban growth and development. So we came up with that name that we're using now called Urban Growth Strategies um, as basically an umbrella name to talk about this set of work. So tonight we'll walk through each of the components that is shown as a bar on this graphic, which was in the meeting packet. Um, and then, like I said, we'll answer questions at the end. Um, 
As far as the e-tax rule, the components that have e-tax touch, touch points are in color on this graphic. Um, the component might have a really big, might be a lot of technical pieces for your review um, or guidance, or it might just be a small piece. Um, but if there was any e-tax touch points associated with this component, I left it in color so, you, so it would catch your eye. Um, those components that are strictly policy in nature or our general public engagement, um, those won't come to the ETAC. However, um, there are going to be a lot of types of public engagement on this project. And so I think it's important for the ETAC to be aware of all of the different components. So on the technical side of kind of public engagement, the ETAC is reviewing information or will be reviewing information that is developed from consultants. Um, and that information will be informed by um, topic specific or um, expert working groups. Um, there might be some individual interviews and public engagement. Um, so that's going to be the e-tax role. Um, but again, it's important for you to see the non-technical components of the projects because I know that you all, as you just talked about, wear a lot of different hats. And sometimes we start to go down those policy um, or want to go down those policy conversations at this meeting. And so what's great about this is that you'll be aware of the the components, even if they're more policy driven components, and where you can plug in or your constituents or your um, networks can plug in um, and have those policy conversations. Um, and I would encourage you to do that. Um, the ETAC bylaws include as your role um, to serve as liaisons, connecting the general public, key community members, community groups and organizations to this work um, and encouraging participation in this process. So we're hopeful that um, you can also help share with your networks about these upcoming, this upcoming work and these other opportunities. And I will kick it to Leah. Okay, thanks Heather. There's obviously a lot <laughs> on that timeline. So Hopefully we'll uh, be able to illuminate it a little bit more clearly. Um, I'm going to go through those first three bars on the timeline, which really are mo more related to the housing components of this suite of work. Um, and of course, to make it more complicated, the this urban growth strategies work, this project is going to align really closely and kind of envelop parts of our work to implement the state's new climate friendly and equitable communities rules or CFEC rules. So some of you have heard about this, um, but at a high level, the CFEC rules are a new set of requirements for cities to help meet the state's um, emissions reduction goals through mostly changes to our transportation and housing planning systems kind of aimed at reducing vehicle miles traveled um, and emission from personal vehicles. So Eugene and Springfield, and other metro areas across the state are required to really relook at some of our development standards to encourage more climate friendly development. One of the required components of the CFEC rules is to identify and assess our most promising locations for what are called climate friendly areas across the city. So climate friendly areas are kind of designated areas where people, um, most people can meet their daily needs without relying on a car. So the climate friendly areas selection and designation will serve as an urban growth strategy kind of within this larger suite of work. Um, we're right now polishing up our kind of climate friendly areas study, which is a uh, we'll submit to the state at the end of this year. And that's primarily a technical analysis. It considers really the kind of prescriptive state requirements um, and where in Eugene can initially meet those criteria. But starting in 2024, we'll begin the process to actually kind of narrow down and select Eugene's climate friendly areas. Um, that selection will include community engagement, a recommendation from planning commission and a decision from council. We hope um, to meet the intent of the CFEC rules to get that decision from council by the end of 2024. 
to get you know, climate friendly areas designated and adopted, we expect to do amendments to the land use code, probably some new policies in the Envision Eugene Comprehensive Plan, which Seward will talk about, and possibly also our transportation system plan. We intend to kind of adopt these plan and code amendments in within this larger suite, our adoption package um, for the entire urban growth strategies project or components of it in 2026. Um, I think important for this conversation is that the climate friendly areas designation isn't intended to be static. So we'll kind of monitor the designation and potentially need to increase the areas under this designation um, during future UGB analyses, so every eight years on this cycle. Climate-friendly areas are an example of one of our efficiency measures. So as I think you all know, these are policy measures that will work to identify, develop, and refine over the next couple of years. Um, efficiency measures look at how we can use residential and employment lands more efficiently, hence the name. Um, so getting more housing and jobs on land than there would have been prior. Those policy measures should also help us to achieve our goals as a city. So achieving our economic development goals and our housing goals around housing production, affordability, and choice. As a part of um, the efficiency measure process, um, we want to look and look at and understand what the realistic capacity will be for development within climate-friendly areas. Um, and what other sorts of kind of incentives or policies we might need to encourage housing and employment efficiency through this kind of mixed use development designation. Um, so we'll be doing that redevelopment analysis in early to mid 2024. Um, and we do see this group as having a role um, in supporting the redevelopment analysis and kind of efficiency measures more broadly. In addition to CFAs, which we know will be using, um, efficiency measures could include kind of a broad range of other policy tools. So new development incentives, you know, we have the multiple unit property tax exemption program, um, which is a, a previous efficiency measure, could be reducing system development charges for certain types of housing, could be changing comprehensive plan designations or rezoning land, could be um, changing our existing zones to increase allowable densities, or otherwise kind of tweaking the land use code to provide more flexibility um, and increase that efficiency. So kind of taking another step up, climate friendly areas are an example of an efficiency measure. Efficiency measures will fit into our housing production strategy. So the housing production strategy is really the strategic document that will outline and identify and prioritize tools, actions, and policies to address housing needs and specifically to increase housing production. Um, like I said, it'll include those policy measures, the efficiency measures, but it could also include you know, investments and other programs um, to get at that housing production. The HPS is a new document to the city. Um, it's a new state statutory requirement um, and it will build on the work that the city has done to develop the housing implementation pipeline or the HIP. Um, which is a five-year council-approved internal work program. So the HPS will identify actions that we intend to implement over an eight-year planning period. So we'll update that each time we go through this UGB analysis. Similar to the HIP, the HPS will look at actions that address housing needs for both rental and home ownership opportunities and for a range of income levels from people experiencing homelessness through to market rate housing production. It will also consider strategies or tool policies and actions to preserve existing affordable housing um, and protect folks who might be at risk to housing displacement. With that, I will hand it off to Heather to talk a little bit about how we'll determine those housing and other land use needs. Thanks. Um, yeah, so some of this will be familiar to those of you that were on the technical resource group during the last UGB analysis, um, or if you've looked at our comprehensive plan and the attachments to it are these residential and employment land studies. And so um, these next pieces are moving into some of the more technical components. Um, so again, this work will result in three um 
land supply studies, which we actually combined into two last time, and that might be the same here, but essentially one for housing, one for jobs, and one for other miscellaneous um, urban land needs. And we'll talk, we'll talk about what each of those are. Um, the land supply studies pull together what our needs or our demand is for the next 20 years um, and how we will meet that demand in total. Like I talked about earlier with, are you meeting, do you, what is your buildable lands inventory? Are you meeting it with efficiency measures as well? And do you need to expand? And are you um, meeting it that way as well? So for housing needs, after the um, housing production strategy work that Leah talked about, um, we will work on kind of overlapping with the how what's called the housing capacity analysis. And so it's a pretty technical document that's part of the land supply study um, that details Eugene's housing unit needs for the next 20 years and equates that to the amount of land that is needed to accommodate that future housing development. Um, it also estimates how much of that housing need is likely to be accommodated on Eugene's supply of buildable lands inventory. So you're familiar with that process. Um, the analysis will be heavily informed by uh, the growth monitoring data that you all have been looking at. Um, the housing capacity analysis plus the land use efficiency measures together become essentially our housing land supply. And then again, if we need to expand, that all is how you meet your 20 year need. So we are timing this, the housing capacity analysis um, to start near January, 2025. Um, and the reason that is, is that that is when the state will be publishing new 20 year housing projections for the entire state. Um, as well as new housing planning rules for cities. So we've mentioned this a couple of times at the ETAC. Um, these new rules will implement the state's recent draft Oregon housing needs analysis. Um, and that includes a new methodology for estimating our housing need. And I, I guess new, new, it builds on, it adds to the way that we do housing needs analysis right now. So um, it starts with identifying future housing needs for the entire state and then allocates that total to each of the cities based on each of the city's UGBs based on um, some key factors. And so one of the main differences with this new method is that um, it will actually provide a forecast that is a more complete picture of our housing needs than the way that we've been doing housing or that the rules have been written um, over the past um, since since the beginning <laughs> since the beginning of this land use law. So the current rules and our current UGB is based on um, planning for new housing to accommodate just your projected population growth. So that's that last bullet on the slide. The new method adds on to that a forecast of how much new housing is needed to address any previous years of underproduction of housing in your community, um, as well as housing units for people experiencing homelessness. So based on those draft numbers, the new forecast for Eugene in total is likely to double um, what we've been planning for. So, as you, you know, as you know, when we've looked at um, when we've done the annual growth monitoring report and the comprehensive report, we're measuring how many new housing units. Um, we've seen building permits for compared to the 15,000 that um, we need by 2032. And that was just to accommodate growth by 2032. This is more like 30,000. Um, and again, that, these are draft numbers, but to 2040. So um, what you're seeing here on this slide is that those are draft numbers. We'll get new numbers in January of 2025. And so we're really trying to sync up our housing capacity analysis to be close to that. Otherwise, we won't be um, 
planning for the amount of a total picture of housing um, that we have the opportunity to do if we wait a little bit. So the companion piece to the housing study is the employment land supply study. So within that study is the economic opportunities analysis. Um, that is the very technical piece of the overall study that's similar to the housing capacity analysis in that it lays out what Eugene's employment or job needs will be for the next 20 years and then equates that to um, the amount of land that's needed for future employment development, and then estimates how much of that need is likely to be accommodated on Eugene's um, buildable lands inventory. Again, this analysis will be strongly informed by the growth monitoring data that we've been looking at um, at this group, and, that, and that's the intent, so that's great. Um, there are no new rules really coming for this work like there is for housing. And so we're actually gonna start the economic opportunities analysis work uh, in 2024 and run that alongside the efficiency measure discussion for um, employment land. The economic opportunities analysis plus the land use efficiency measures mentioned earlier together become our employment land supply including if a UGB expansion is needed. So just like housing, just the employment side of it. And while not on this side, the third land supply study will look at 20 year needs for other urban uses like schools, utilities, parks, those kinds of things that need urban um, services. Um, so with our most recently adopted urban growth boundary, we expanded the um, urban growth boundary for land for uh, jobs, parks, excuse me, and schools. <clears throat> and then our analysis took into account, um, you know, how much of our buildable lands inventory looks like it would be used for housing or jobs, but actually is needed for um, parks or other utilities. So we deducted that capacity. So it, it all has to go together. We have to plan for all of those needs at the same time, even though the state is not requiring us to. Um, so together, these, these three analysis will make up the entirety of our UGB land needs for the next 20 years and how it will be met. Um, the ETAC will be reviewing these studies, including these needs, the land demand, and the um, assumptions that will be embedded in those land studies. You'll be looking at those too. And so it's going to look very familiar because a lot of this information is what we've been monitoring over the past couple of years. Turn to Stuart. Hi again, everyone. So I'm gonna provide you with the background and purpose of the Envision Eugene Conference of Plan, as well as an overview of the current project and outline at the end how you can be involved. The Envision Eugene Conference of Plan is kind of the overarching policy document that guides land use decisions and growth within our urban growth boundary. Phase two, or the current phase, uh, is the purpose of it is to develop and present uh, four new chapters along with a couple of administrative changes to other chapters to the Planning Commission and City Council for their consideration. Phase two implements uh, the city's land use vision as outlined in Envision Eugene and will be supplemented with current input from community engagement. The first phase of the comprehensive plan was adopted in 2017 and included chapters essential for establishing the urban growth boundary. Those chapters were economic development, transportation, administration and implementation, and the Eugene Urban Growth Boundary, in addition to an introduction in the glossary. Some of you may recall that phase two began back in 2018, but was put on pause in 2019 as staff was reassigned to other council directed projects. We're really excited now to have the resources to continue this work, and those resources are made possible by a grant called the Transportation and Growth Management Program, which is administered by Oregon Department of Transportation and the Department of Land Conservation and Development. 
The Envision Eugene Conference of Plan project will coordinate closely with the Urban Growth Strategies project that we've just discussed with you. And then the Land Use Designation Map project that Heather will talk about next. Coordination will occur in a lot of different ways, but specifically in public involvement and then policy work um, to really bring all the lessons we've learned and heard about through that public involvement into policy for Eugene. Phase two includes four new chapters and updates to other chapters. The new chapters are housing, compact development and urban design, community health, and my personal favorite, which is public involvement. And there's also gonna be significant updates to the urban growth boundary chapter that will likely include the land use designation map and associated policies. Some work on these chapters already began, so we're not starting from scratch, uh, but we'll be making some pretty significant updates to the chapters as they exist now. And in 2026, staff will develop the materials necessary to steward the phase two of the Envision, Conference of, Envision Eugene Conference of Plan through the adoption process. Now, ETAC doesn't have a direct role in the Conference of Plan policy development, but we just want to invite you and welcome you to participate in many, wearing your many other hats, uh, most of our public engagement activities, and make sure that you uh, let your voices be heard through the process as much, as much as you can. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Heather to talk about the land use designation map. Great. So as part of the phase two comp plan update, um, we are working on a parcel specific land use map that will define land use designations and policies for land within Eugene's urban growth boundary. So I think we've talked about this before at the ETAC when we were working on the buildable lands inventory. Um, as most of you know, we currently rely on the Metro plan, um, which is the shared regional comprehensive plan between Eugene, Springfield, and Lane County. Um, so we currently rely on the land use diagram that is within the Metro plan as the adopted land use map um, again, for Eugene, Springfield, and Lane County, um, for those areas that are within the Metro Plan boundary, but outside of a UGB. This map, however, is only accurate at 11 by 17 scale. And so um, it you can imagine it's uh, for such a big area, but it's at such a small scale. Um, so it makes it really challenging to determine what the land use designation is of a property really quickly. And that creates uncertainty for property owners and developers, um, decision makers and our community. And so that actually leads to more time and cost and delay for development. Um, and so that's why this project is actually a high priority in the housing implementation um, pipeline because of um, hopefully it will reduce um, time cost and delay for housing development. <clears throat> so to address this issue, the project is um, a parcel specific land use map that will clarify those land de designations at a parcel or tax lot level. Um, how they are currently shown on the Metro Plan diagram. So we're basically taking that 11 by 17 and trying to get that to be shown at a tax lot level. So we're just clarifying it, um, like zooming in basically is the way I would think about it. Um, the clarified land use map, along with the policies governing the map and its designation, will be um, adopted into the comprehensive plan. And some of you may know Springfield's already doing this. They've already started their adoption process. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, you, some of you may have other experience with this, but the main way that this has come before the ETAC before is that you have reviewed the GIS methodologies they has brought to you um, about the rules that she put in place in GIS in order to kind of streamline taking that 11 by 17 map and applying it um, at a tax lot level citywide to get an approximate land use designation for all lots in the buildable lands inventory so that we can understand 
you know, an approximation of how much land we have in each comprehensive plan designation. So low density residential, medium density commercial. Um, having this new map though, uh, will actually make it quicker. We won't have to go through all that rules work um, when we rerun the buildable lands inventory, which will be awesome. It'll make monitoring more accurate. Um, and also it will, again, make pretty much anything that we're doing, we're, we're using land use designations uh, more accurate and have better certainty. So I'm um, not gonna get into too much more detail about that. We're actually planning to come back to this group relatively soon in the early in the new year um, to, to discuss the GIS methodology um, that we'll be using to, um, to start the work. And uh, Zoli and Thea will be heading up that work. Okay, and then a few more components that bookend all of this. So as I mentioned, the buildable lands inventory, um, typically that's done at the beginning when you start a UGB analysis. And so as you know, we started gearing up for a new buildable lands inventory earlier this year. You had an overview of the BLI methodology in August, um, but we are now planning to wait a year to rerun the buildable lands inventory. And the reason that is, is to line it up better with when we'll get our new housing projections in January of 2025. Um, that will allow our new land inventory to be as up-to-date as possible with what land is still buildable um, right in alignment with when we get our new housing projections. And that will also mean we'll have a clean baseline um, for when we start counting building permits from that projected need towards meeting um, our housing needs. So uh, it, it's, uh, we started that work and it, and it still will inform when we actually kick it off in 2025, um, but um, we are pressing pause a little bit on the BLI. And then at the other end of the spectrum is the um, potential urban growth boundary expansion. After we have identified how much additional development capacity we can get with new land use efficiency measures that Leah discussed, if there's still a need to expand the urban growth boundary, we'll be able to first look um, at land inside the recently adopted urban reserves. Um, so we will undertake the state-directed um, UGB expansion analysis based on how much land we need and what type of that land. Is it housing? Is it um, jobs? What is it? Um, so new rules you can see on the slide, new rules for exactly how to do this are due January of 2026. So they're going to be amending the urban growth boundary um, expansion rules. Um, and they're really intended to make that analysis clearer and reduce appeals. Um, so we're excited to see um, just basically provide more clarity to all of the parties about what the standards are for UGB expansion. Um, so we're just excited to see more clarity in the rules in general. <clears throat> and then Leah. So obviously there's a, a lot coming in this suite of work. And as we were kind of packaging this into the umbrella of urban growth strategies, I think it was, it is really important to us that uh, the community understands how they can engage in this work and it feels meaningful um not just kind of one technical component but really this like overarching strategy for eugene's growth over the next 20 years so we're um going to kind of launch a multi-project multi-pronged public involvement strategy starting in um 2024 and early next year um, so that'll inform the policy level outcomes to this work within the comprehensive plan. It'll inform kind of strategy level work and the housing production strategy, as well as um, where it makes sense that really like technical work um, leading up to the UGB analysis. So um, all that to say, and I think Heather might have mentioned this, if we do need to expand the urban growth boundary, that would be a whole nother 
public involvement strategy um, and many more years of reaching out to the public. But, you know, you all will be certainly tagged in a lot of this work um, to give kind of your tax and technical perspective and your expertise from your backgrounds, which um, you have a lot of years of experience in informing this work collectively. Um, in addition to that, we're really looking how we can go wide across the community to make sure people understand what's coming and how they can inform this work, as well as deep with um, not only our technical stakeholders, but um, with kind of historically marginalized communities, especially when it comes to the housing related work, which we know puts so much strain um, on our communities. So a lot, there will be a lot of ways to engage and stay informed. You know, we'll be updating the website and engage Eugene, go um, sending out regular updates through the huge planning newsletter. We'll do in-person and virtual open houses, surveys, kind of targeted outreach for specific communities, interviews and focus groups. Um, be going to various city boards and commissions, including you all as, as ETAC. And then of course, there's kind of the formal planning commission and council process where folks can weigh in. So there'll be a lot of opportunities to engage. Um, I think that's been previewed. And I'll also say, in addition to this urban growth strategies work, we're trying to think about how we can coordinate with other city projects that are looking to reach the public about housing topics, about renter cost burden topics, um, around livability and access topics. So specifically with our housing team, the sustainability program um, and likely others trying to make sure this outreach is efficient and um, meaningful to folks. With that, is Heather, you're wrapping it up. Yeah, thank you. So before we get to questions, I just want to make sure that you know, you're aware. So when we come back with these individual components, we'll definitely do a deeper dive into each of the, what the components are. Um, this was really meant to give you a high level understanding of the overall project, high level understanding of the different components, as well as the timeline. Um, and after we're done with questions, um, I'd actually like to move the agenda item for um, next steps and ETAC meetings up because we can um, look at the tentative calendar for ETAC meetings so you can see how um, these different components will come to you. So I'm going to stop sharing. Am I still sharing? Are you seeing it still? Okay, good. So questions. All right, who has questions? I don't see any hands up quite yet. I I wrote one in my, I've been, I've been taking notes just to, because I wanted to think of my questions as they were coming. Um, I have a question about the, um, you know, the housing needs analysis and, and all that stuff. And it sounds like, it sounds like we're waiting for the ONA. Is that right? So we're waiting for that to come out so that we can start talking about strategies. And I'm kind of curious. Um, I know that it, we have to go through all the process and everything, but would we do things differently based on that? Like my understanding is we're so far behind that like whether we identify that our housing needs analysis tell us we need, you know, this many units or this many units, I'm just going to say that they, none of those numbers are within reach based on what we, you know, kind of been doing. And I guess I'm just kind of curious if, um, is there a reason we have to wait to start working on some of these housing strategies? Cause we know we have to get housing going and it's going to take years. And I, like, I know that's policy stuff, but as far as just like starting the process, I'm just kind of curious if there's a yeah. separate track that's happening where there's actually things that they're working on. Yeah. And actually that in a way, and I'll, and Leah then um, jump in if I could just start. Um, so I mentioned that $30,000, $30,000, $30,000, um, people projection. So in a way, we're fortunate that we have draft numbers. Um, we don't anticipate that the numbers that come out in January in 2025 are going to be too different. Um, so we already have a target that we can work from. And like you said, it's um, 
it is a big number. Um, right. And so, so actually what we're doing is we're starting with the strategies first, um, uh -huh. which actually feels really good because it is like money where your mouth is, you know, rubber beats the road, however you want to think about it. It is, those are the things that are going to get us new housing, reduce barriers. Um, and Leah will talk about those. The land need is kind of the secondary part, but like really focusing on what those strategies is, um, is actually pretty exciting that we get to start with that instead of having to wait. It definitely took my brain a minute, like, oh, but I need to know how many units. And it's like, well, yeah, we actually do know. And it's really big. So just go all out with your housing production strategies. <laughs> right. <laughs> kind of the yeah, best. It seems to me. Well, and so as a follow-up, I'm just curious if we're doing, if there's any analysis that's part of this process that is looking at what those barriers are. I mean, uh, you know, interest rates are really high right now. So if that's the biggest barrier out there, for example, um, what, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I'm not sure how much, what levers the city could actually pull, but I'm curious as if there is work being done to actually dig, dig down into identifying what those, you know, what are those barriers? Yeah. Land or... I I can start that and Heather, you can add on, but um, the housing production strategy, while it is focused on tools, actions, and policies, levers that the city can pull, um, it will start with what is our housing need, both the data and um, kind of qualitative information, what we're hearing from our community, and the barriers um, to producing housing in our community. So that will kind of have that grounding information. And that's actually where we're gonna start in early 2024 with our engagement. We'll be focused on those two things, needs and barriers. Um, and then moving into, okay, what are all the strategies and the levers that the city can pull or how we can be partners um, in the community to get that production moving. And we'll have the housing production strategy more or less pretty finished by the end of 2024. And then we'll just need to go back to it with the final numbers um, from the housing needs analysis, housing capacity analysis. So, um, and luckily we, so the housing production strategy is new to us, but we already have the HIP and the HIP accomplishes a lot of the same things or, or tries to, strives for that. Where can we invest dollars? What kind of units do we need? What are the policies that we want to put in place as a city. And so the housing production strategy will build on the success of the HIP. Um, the HIP goes through 2027. The housing production strategy will be kind of adopted and in place starting in 2027. So they'll, I think, be kind of a natural building block on top of each other. Um, and internally, we've already started kind of scanning what are the potential strategies that might land yeah. in this HPS. Um, what are things that are already kind of in in the works that um, we can drop into our HPS as well to kind of formalize them? So definitely not waiting. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, that's good news. Well, thanks, Leah. That's helpful. Um, who else has questions? I mean, really, nobody. Oh, Phil, I see your hand up. Yeah. That was a question. I'll, I'll go ahead, and uh, I've got a a series of them here that I've been keeping notes on, but let me try and just start off from the top. I mean, this is very ambitious and it's very rigorous. Uh, I think y'all have done a really good job of kind of scoping this whole thing and trying to put some sort of order to all these different requirements that, you know, are, are somewhat state imposed, uh, otherwise needed. Um, we have this historic underproduction of housing, so we know that. Um, even if there were no impediments and you were to determine after a year's worth of study that there, hey, there's no impediment. The market should be doing what it, what it should be doing and we've got enough land or something like that. It's just, we know it hasn't been happening because we had this big hole and we have very um, meager um, population growth and housing production relative to the need that we have. And that's why we have partly this big um, spike in, in inaffordability of housing uh, across the spectrum. There's just so much demand and so much need. So <clears throat> has there been thought, I, I don't want to stray into the policy 
uh, arena, but has there been thought of thinking of like what Tiffany's talking about, of trying to goose along something? Other cities have, you know, really try to take bold initiatives about we're gonna we're gonna try a bond measure for um, you know uh, a, a big uh, bolus of funding to be able to support housing. We've talked about here in in this venue before about our needs and where the work that we did as part of the um, urban reserves areas and some of those that we identified as including into the urban reserves and we acknowledge that there's a need for infrastructure to support really that area to be developed. So I mean I think that even though we may include areas within the BLI we have before areas that are sloped they're just not as easy or they're more expensive to, to develop and a lot of it keep, keeps coming back to infrastructure. So is there any thought that like trying to advance this work and take whatever pieces of it that may be able to be done sooner than later? Is there something like that that maybe we could spall off while we're still doing this kind of state mandated and required analysis and planning work, but that there are other things that could let us kind of vault over to truly get more production done in a much quicker timeline than five to six or seven years? Um, <laughs> I was trying to think of how to respond to that without getting into the policy discussion. Um, but then I saw where you were headed with it. Um, Cause my initial response was that's exactly what we're gonna be talking about when we kick off the um, housing production strategy um, discussion next year. And when I say next year, I mean like right away, you know, I mean, it's starting right away. And there's other work that is going on, which Leah alluded to around the city and around the community that we're trying to dovetail with, right? Um, because you're right, we are still in this land use box. The housing production strategy requirements are kind of new for land use planning because they do cross over into things like financial tools, bond, you know, whatever it is. Um, they do touch on infrastructure. Absolutely. There's a lot of stuff in there that is not zoning code plan designation change, stuff like that, that we're used to calling. Um, and so really, you know, again, efficiency measures is a subset of these larger housing production strategies that may not even be related to land use specifically, but all go in the bucket of trying to make it easier to do housing. Um, and so, so I guess what I would say, and Leah, feel free to jump in, um, is that we do have our requirements, but there are other efforts. The um, federal consolidated plan work is going to be going on. Um, there's work at the chamber. I mean, there's there is a lot of work going on, and so. Um, I don't, I think that there's other work that's going on that isn't going to get stopped because we're doing this, right? We're trying to work with the other work that's going on and definitely not get in the way, but actually pull that work into ours as far as like, um, yes, we're doing this work over here. We're not trying to stop it, but we're getting credit for it in the housing production strategy. Um, does that make sense? And so I think, you know, if a bond or whatever it is, um, is coming up in some other venue, um, looking at how to get more housing downtown, those things are all going to, everything that is going on is going to continue happening. And we're just going to try to identify if there are more things that people aren't um, focused on and also incorporate those things into the umbrella of the HPS. And the, and I will say a couple things too. You know, this is new for us. Like I said, um, this is ambitious, and it is because of the nature. And when we get, you know, when we talk about the HPS, um, you know, it's financial things, it's zoning code, it's um, like there's like what eight different categories of things um, of strategies, and so. 
It is requiring a lot of, it will require, it already is requiring, and we haven't even really started it yet, a lot of coordination with other city staff, other partners in the community um, to, again, make sure, like Leah said, we're not um, stepping on toes, we're coordinating, we're using everybody's time efficiently, and we're not getting in the way, like you said, Phil, of good ideas that are happening elsewhere. So, um, just know that we are, it doesn't mean that isn't going to happen. We're trying our best, um, but we do have an ambitious timeline because we're required to. So, and, and also we could just ignore the fact that new housing pro, um, uh, projection estimates are coming out in January and just plan for our growth but I don't think anybody wants us to do that, right? I mean, I think every, you know, the housing affordability issue is so big that it would be like kind of sticking our head in the sand if we just looked at, um, so we really are trying in a way to have our cake and eat it too. Um, you know, do as much as we can now, wait for those new numbers to come out, but, you know, we have the draft numbers and then build on the momentum that's happening in the community around housing strategy in general. I know I talked way more than I should have, but. Um. No, I think that was a really good summary, uh, Heather. And the only thing I would add is that we have already internally as um, an across departmental staff team looked at kind of a list of um, strategies that could show up in our HPS that the, the state generated. Um, and so there's over like a hundred ideas basically in that document. And we're already doing a lot. Um, we're already in some way doing like half of the things that were on that list. And so I, and looking at other communities who have already put out their HPS in the last year, I look at their list of actions. I'm like, we have that, we have that, we have that, we have that. So what what we do do and to, in order to take that next step is going to have to be pretty big um and there's a lot of that kind of cooking already to heather's points in the community that we can kind of capitalize on and take credit for to meet kind of these state statutes okay any additional questions i i have one other question um that i just thought of so, you know, I don't know if you all had heard about this, but we got a presentation from Henry Fields with the Oregon Employment Department, and he had shared that Eugene's population has had declined, like that that's never happened. And, it, and in recent year, this year, maybe the last kind of two, um, we actually saw an, an out migration of population. And so I'm curious about like what, what, what assumptions and are we adjusting assumptions based on things like that? And cause I, I just, it sounds strange to say this, but it feels like, you know, word on the street is there's no housing in Eugene, Oregon. And so you would assume that people at a certain point would be just thinking, well, gosh, I heard there's no housing there. I'm not going to take a job here. And I know that is not a good thing, but it seems to me like at a certain point, the need starts to self adjust perhaps, or the need just starts, you know, just starts to change. And so I'm just kind of curious of, as to how, what, what we're tracking to see, you know, is it something we do every year and we look at those numbers or is it something we just kind of, we have this number that's, we're going to use that one for the next decade. And regardless of how things might, you know, I'm just kind of curious of where we get that, the, that data point. Yeah. Um, and some of this, some of these detailed questions I think are going to be better. You know, we can really get into them when we get to these different components. Um, and even if we, you know, yeah. So I would just say that. Um, but you know that we're tracking population um, estimates. You've seen that in the annual report and the comprehensive report. Right. We only get a forecast um, every three to four years. That new forecast we'll be getting in January of 2025. So every time we get a forecast, it goes into our population growth rate um, information uh, chart and the report and everything. And when those kinds of things happen, um, which we haven't reported, we haven't done our annual report for 2020, 
where are we? 2023. We haven't done our annual report for 2023 yet. And so we'll be looking, we do get, um, we do look a little bit deeper when there is information like that. Um, I will say that we have known, and I think we put this in the comprehensive report, the forecast was that if not for net in migration, we, Oregon in general, would be declining in population because of the birth and death rate. Um, and so births, deaths are outpacing births, but because of net in migration, um, we are growing, and that is the same for Lane County. Um, our population forecast that we'll be getting in January of 2025 is exciting because it's actually going to have more detail than we've ever had at the city level. Um, and so TBD on what that's all going to be, but I think it's going to have more demographic information. Typically, we've only had that at the county level for forecasting. Mm -hmm. um, and so that stuff you know, what we're required to use comes from Portland State U University. That's the law. That's what we have to use. Um, but we do have, they do give us as much additional information as they can. Okay. Well, I don't see any other hands. So okay. I, if we want to move on to the growth monitoring community dashboard, I think we're probably ready for that next item. Unless Heather, you were saying something about wanting to go through the tentative calendar first. Is that I could? Um, I know there's at least one person. Phil, what time do you have to leave? Because I would love everyone to get oh. a quick view of the dashboard. Yeah, I'm just going to hang out and be with oh. you guys. So, yeah, never mind. Great. Sorry for whoever is missing out on your attendance. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to share my screen then. And um, Can you see a colorful spreadsheet? Yes. Great. Guys, you all know that I'm good for a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this is very tentative, um, but wanted to give you a sense of what's coming down the pike, particularly for 2024, um, because it's gearing up to be a jam-packed year. So, this is subject to change um, within a month or two of what I've got um, outlined here, um, but not too much because we have a deadline of trying to get all of our housing analysis done um, to start the adoption process in January or early 2026. So we don't have a ton of wiggle room. So here we are. Is that size okay? Can I get a little uh growth monitoring um because those that review will still be happening but what we're hoping is that um over the years the annual report review will be shorter than it has been um we've we've only done it once but shorter than it is even showing here that we'll be able to um kind of narrow down your meetings on that a little bit um but we think, and again, these are a little bit subject to change, but what we're hoping is that some amount of the building permit data we'll be reviewing with you um, for the annual report in January. And we are asking that you continue to hold um, the February 1st meeting because we think that we will need to um, do some additional building permit data review with you then or potentially from the 15th. Um, the 15th you can see is pretty stacked with um, census data and housing sales data and potentially some other um, miscellaneous annual report data. Um, and then the 7th, March, um, and I probably don't need to go through it in this detail, but in March, we would be looking at um, population, which we were just talking about, um, population and jobs data. But again, those might change around a little bit. Um, we are also asking that you hold the March 21st meeting um, in case there is some follow-up. So that's our typical meeting time. Um, but 
we have some staff that are going to be out of the office. And so we're trying to also move some things around so that um, we've got the right staff around. Um, well, we've got all the staff around for um, for all, most of the growth monitoring stuff because Elena and I work best when we are together. I feel like <laughs> I need her. <laughs> um, but there could be some follow up. So it, it might be a smaller meeting on the 21st if we have it. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the land use map. So that lot specific land use map um, bringing you the methodology potentially in April to look at. Um, and then getting into the rest of the urban growth strategies work. So we would be starting out with the redevelopment analysis, and that's associated also with climate friendly areas. Um, and then getting into the EOA, the economic opportunities analysis in May. And hopefully um, coming back to you at that point with the final annual report, which is we did that last time, we kind of chunked it out and then came back to you. So it could be that that um, doesn't need to be its own meeting item. We might be able to condense that with something else. Um, and then after getting feedback from you on the initial redevelopment analysis methodology and the key assumptions we're using in that, um, we would come back to you in June with the results and the implications of basically redevelopment um, potential in the city in certain areas um, and associated with maybe different efficiency measures. Um, the rest of June, well, I think this redevelopment analysis, I'm not sure where it will fall, the first or the second meeting. But um, July 4th, our first July meeting is canceled because it's a holiday. Um, we know we'll need ETAC elections. So July and August are kind of TBD, and oftentimes we end up canceling those, although we did meet last August. Um, and then potentially getting into the other land needs, so other 20-year land needs, schools, public utilities, parks, things like that. Um, September, probably the the later meeting in September, we would be looking at the housing production strategy um, as far as the what the need is, and that's pretty structured. That come, again comes from the state, so that will be more informing you on that information, um, but then how that relates to the housing efficiency measures that we've gathered um, public feedback on, um, and how much capacity we think that those efficiency measures will get us. And then we'll start on buildable lands inventory prep in the fall. And the goal is so we can get some of those um, questions or overview discussions about the BLI methodology out of the way so that Thay is ready to run it in January first of 2025 and um, then do the manual cleanup for the first part of 2025. Um, so we'll be coming back to you probably in November with the um, employment, the EOA, the employment opportunities analysis. Um, and so how much, what our demand is, whether or not, um, we have identified what, if we've identified efficiency measures um, and how much additional capacity those could get. So similar to the HPS and the efficiency measures up here, but for employment. Um, and then ideally we would bring you, we would start talking about um, permit data for the next annual report um, late in 2024 so that it's not all happening in January. And then you'll love that we've even got 2025 mapped out because this schedule is so 
compressed, um, we kind of had to start doing that. So, um, like I said, these are all subject to change, but I really wanted to give you a heads up on that um, because there's a lot. Um, and it's a bit, you know, I was worried we'd be doing a lot of back and forth between growth monitoring and the urban growth strategies stuff, but it, it actually is working out that we can kind of chunk the topic areas. So that's good. So any questions on that? Yeah, I see your hand now, Phil. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, just, I mean, actually more of a comment uh, first. You know, I, I really have to tip my hat to you guys. I mean, the way you've scoped all this out, and it is a ton of work that has been dropped on your plate, like you didn't have anything else to do. And so, you know, you guys are doing an awesome job of kind of figuring out how to plug all this in and you know glad that Leah and Stuart are on staff now but I mean I guess one of the questions I have is do you have enough people to do this work I know you're going to have some other consultants and TGM might might allow you to hire some people I don't know if you're going to use LCOG on the um, uh, site-specific map stuff which you know I was on the group that spring that they had worked with for Springfield but I mean you know, you guys need some help, man. This is awesome. But, you know, you got to take meals and stuff like that. Um, right. Well, you heard me <laughs> talking about vacation, you know, people not being here, right? The part of that is vacations. Like people need to step away. <laughs> yeah. Um. So luckily, I think we have solid support in that area. Um. Yeah, no doubt. And so it's going to be clunky. Um, I feel like there was a time when maybe we brought stuff to you and we said, uh, because of the timelines, things are not as polished as we would like them to be. I think we might be running into that at certain points next year. Um, that's going to happen. Um, I will say Leah, I think, or Stuart mentioned the TGM. We also got a housing assistance grant from DLCD. Um, Echo Northwest, who worked on our last UGB an analysis, who's been our consultant um, as needed on growth monitoring and um, won the contract for um, doing this UGB analysis. So that's great. They're um, very knowledgeable in Eugene issues and, um, and have been reviewing our growth monitoring data. So that's actually with the lens of like, what do we need for doing a UGB analysis? So that's pretty exciting. Um, but yes, do we have enough staff? Probably not. Do we have enough money? Probably not. Um, <laughs> but we, you know, we are getting assistance from the state and, you know, everybody's asking for it. So that's the other hard thing is there isn't enough money to go around for sure. So we're super grateful to get what we did get. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to be 2024 is going to be a wild ride. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Hey, does it look All like right. any other questions? Yeah, any other questions? I don't see any other hands. Then I will jump into uh, the long awaited, anticipated um, <laughs> public facing dashboard with our growth monitoring data. Um, and so, just a kind of reminder um, so we'll have the comprehensive report. Then we have the annual report, which is a little bit more scaled down. Then we'll have the dashboard, which is really um, key data. Um, so it's a little bit more scaled down than the annual report, not meant to be comprehensive, um, but will definitely help with, you know, we do get a number of data requests from members of the public or the media, um, especially around like middle housing numbers and stuff like that. And it'll be great for staff to kind of point folks to our website where they can download this data and have that available um, pretty immediately um, as opposed to taking staff time to do that or saying that it's not available. 
Um, so it's not published yet, but I have it on, on preview on our website. And so I'm just going to walk through. Um, we have eight different dashboard topics, um, and I'm just going to show you what we've got. Okay. All right, so this is currently what okay. What our landing page looks like. Hey, Elena, yep. I, I can only see your background, which is okay. amazing. I was okay. going to say, whatever that okay. is, it lo just looks like where I'd rather be. Right okay, <laughs> it's Playa, Playa del Carmen in Mexico. Um, um. Mm, okay, now can you see? No, okay. No, I think what you're... are they? If you do stop share, I think. Well, you can what if I try it again? Okay. What if I put it over here? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, here is the landing page. Um, and not all of this is totally finalized, but this is kind of what it is going to look like. We'll have a user guide for folks to tell them how they can download the data and some of those tips and tricks on how to read the charts that we've included in the comprehensive report, and then basically have buttons to take folks to each of the different dashboards. So I will show you the preview for population. I'm just going to scroll scroll through. Um, so we have some introductory text that actually lives on the website. And then there's text that's embedded within the dashboard itself. Um, so we're using basically the ta the dashboards are created within Tableau and then we're embedding them into our website. Um, so we have the annual average annual growth rate chart and these charts are also um, sort of interactive in the sense that you can hover over them. Um, this one doesn't have any really additional information but some of them do. Um, we have annual population estimates and trend. So yeah, you can you can see if you hover over, you can get that specific um, number. And that is population. I'm gonna hop to jobs. We have average annual employment growth rate, and then our unemployment rate. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep going if I can see. This is housing development, quantity, and housing mix. So we have dwellings on average per year. Again, kind of use that hover over um, to get some of the specific data points. Whoops, didn't mean to click on that. There we go. number percentage of dwelling by housing mix and dwellings by housing mix and percent of need met. And keep going. <laughs> housing development, development incentives. So we have our dwellings by efficiency measure and plan designation. And the same thing for our downtown programs specifically. And then, oh, housing development density. Also includes a couple of charts for average net density by housing subcategory. Housing development acres developed. Looks like some of the formatting on a couple of these is being funky for some reason, um, but you, you're you getting the gist of where, where we're at. So some of them ha are um, filtered. So let's see here, that will update to um, based on the filters here. And then we have our two employment 
dashboards, so permits and development incentives, employment permits by subcategory, and acres developed with employment efficiency measures by plan designation, category and BLI category. And again, another place to, whoops, another place where there's a filter. And then lastly, we have employment development acres developed. Um, yeah, and so basically, whoops, it's sorry, it's weird to be in preview mode, it, it, but um, basically it will give the folks the option to download the data. They'll be able to download the data again, because I'm in preview, it's not gonna let me do that, but um, basically we'll be able to down CSV files into their own Excel spreadsheets and have access to all of this data. Um, one thing that I'll mention is that the data on the dashboard won't necessarily line up with our reports. So there may be uh, different information available in the reports versus what we have published on our dashboard. Um, but the dashboard will be pretty clear in what the extract data extraction dates are. Um, and yeah. Do you want me to, I can stop sharing or if people want me can to- I just add on to that really quick, the data extraction thing. Um, so as an example, uh, building census data we get once a year. So when we do the annual report, what we put on the, um, the annual report and the census data on the dashboard is going to align for a year, right? But building permit data, we are going to try to update quarterly on the um, on the dashboard. And so we will have an annual report and the comprehensive report, um, which will get older and older as as we as we get older. Um, but it it will. Um, we think it's important because that was one of the goals was to have particularly building permit data um, somewhat um, uh, up to date. And, you know, we really had hoped to be able to do it more frequently, but we're even having a hard time reviewing building permit data quarterly. And part of that is because of some of the updates that we'll be talking to you about in January that we recently did related to the middle housing code amendments, but um, we're still not in that cycle yet of being able to review building permit data annually. A lot of it is automated, but there is still manual review that we need to do. We just can't, we couldn't get around it. And so um, anyway, so quarterly is what we're gonna try to do. That's what we're trying to commit to. And if in the future we can do it more frequently, then maybe we will, but quarterly feels pretty good given we um, we aren't doing it at all right now. So. <laughs> well, I will chime in because if anyone has comments or anything, I, that is a really cool tool. I know most of the people in Eugene probably, I would be worried if they had, you know, if you had a big lot of traffic, but honestly, I am in multiple conversations that I think that data actually is, comes in handy. And I think a lot of people who are obviously working with that data would, that is really great. I, I love it. I think it's a, it's going to be, um, is it, is it hard to maintain? Is it one of those super labor intensive things, um, to have to update numbers and whatnot, but it was hard. I would say it was, uh, tedious to get to this point in the creation and development of the pages. Yeah. Ho hopefully the maintenance won't be too okay. bad because it's pulling from our, our data warehouse, essentially, um, where we're keeping other data. So um, shouldn't be a ton of manual work. Did you also mention, um, this is kind of related. So we started with the, did you mention that this is like phase one of the dashboard? I didn't say that. Okay. Um, that's kind of related because we started with the things that were most key. Um, 
and that people, particularly building permit data, people want most regularly. Um, they want to know about population growth. They want to know about building permit data. They want to know about housing. Um, but we do have a second round and it can grow potentially. Um, but to your point, um, it can't grow too much. <laughs> but we do have a second round of like key data around housing affordability and um, potentially information by zone or things like that, that um, we hope to get up on the web once we get this under our belt. All right. Anyone else questions, comments? <sighs> Well, Phil gives me gives us gives it a double thumbs up. That's good. You can incorporate the picture of Mexico somehow. Right. Awesome. <laughs> I like that idea. Well, I think we are to the end of the agenda. I have to pull it up just to double check. Am I right? Yep. It's on a different screen, but okay. Oh, Sue. I'm sorry, Sue. I see you now. You move whenever your hand goes up. So <laughs> It's okay. I just had a last minute urge to say something. Um, I just, I really wanted to piggyback on Philip's comments about staff work on this. One of the things that I like so much about it is that even though there have been some gaps in meeting schedules and all, um, the information has flowed and you've all kept us linked in, I think, in the most effective way you can. Um, it's such a huge project. And it's totally impressive what you've all done and what you continue to do. And I think, um, you know, the testimony that we're all still here is really about you people and not so much us. Um, but I personally just think that you've done a masterful job in keeping us engaged, even though this is going on for a long time. I have to say, when I looked at the, the, um, the big spreadsheet earlier today that goes all the way to 2029. Oh my God. I mean, I was thinking I will be really old by then and, you know, probably not involved <laughs> here anymore, but somehow it's still very exciting and very interesting. And I really, I, I attribute that to staff work on this. And I, I know I keep saying that at almost every meeting, but it is such an example of such exemplary work. And I, I think it just can't go unrecognized. Yes, very well said. So Heather, you have your hand up. Thank, thank you for that um, so much. And I always have to say, we, we really couldn't do it without you. I mean, um, the feedback that you give, you all give is invaluable. Um, and, you know, I think I'm excited to get into the regular cycle that means less, in theory, means less meetings on growth monitoring. But, you know, um, every time there's a code change like middle housing that had a pretty big impact on growth monitoring, um, the city just um, uh, exempted all development from having to do minimum um, parking standards so that we need to figure out how do, do we how do we want do we monitor that you know and so it, it is an ongoing program um, and the other thing I wanted to mention and then also the UGB analysis you know every eight years seems like a long time for how but um we would prefer not to do it at this breakneck speed um and so you know eight years is probably um gonna be here before we know it um and the other thing i want to just do a huge shout out i know we've got at least one attendee that is from our it staff um we also could not do growth monitoring particularly which informs um the ugb analysis without our it staff they have been they have really taken this work under their wing and taken ownership of it and it's been huge um and you know, I think it was kind of one of those things where we knew not what we asked um, and they knew <laughs> um, and they were worried, um, but they have really um, been uh, huge partners in this. And so it's great for them to hear from you all how um, 
informative and helpful you think that this work is because Elena and I get to hear it, um, but but they, and we relay it, of course, but it is um, great for them to hear it from you. So thank you all for your time for sure as well. Okay, well, thank you. All right, you guys, I won't keep you from uh, your evenings any longer, but oh, my dog's behind me. <laughs> um, I'll go ahead and adjourn our meeting and we will see you next time and keep us posted Elena with you know dates and anything that's maybe subject to change but um I'm I appear available so far on all your dates so sounds good I'll update calendar invites probably tomorrow canceling okay. some of December and stuff so <clears throat> thank nice you to meet the new staff too nice to meet you yeah welcome you'll be seeing more <laughs> of us I'm sure <laughs> good all right, you guys. Well, have a good night. We'll see you soon. And happy holidays. Yeah. Happy holidays. Bye, everyone. Thank you.